dia burgemestre, dia minister, former prime minister of Finland, dear rector, it is a great privilege for me as president of the administrative council of the college to be here with you in this beautiful theater of the 19th century, of this beautiful city of Bruges. And it is a privilege because every year when we start a new promotion, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, it's great to greet you. You are going to have, I'm sure, an excellent time. You're going to, to work a lot, hard. The rector and the professors will keep an eye on you on this, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. And it is a privilege to, to host today Alex Stubb. Uh, the first time I met Alex Stubb, he was uh, good looking as he is right now, uh, even younger. And I um, don't know if you remember that, but it was back in the year 1999. Uh, at the time, I was a member of the European Parliament. It was under Finnish presidency. And we were expected to draft the Charter on Fundamental Rights. My problem then, as President of the European Parliament's delegation, is that the European Parliament had appointed the double of members of Parliament to attend that convention. So I had a lot of members of Parliament saying, we want to be in the meeting room. And when I arrived at the meeting room, there was a young, good-looking guy saying, stop, only those who are entitled to govern. Well, I, I won't tell you the outcome of it, maybe Alex does. But five years later, I made the same guy, good looking and young, who had been elected member of the European Parliament. And he said to me, do you remember me? And I said, how could I forget you? <laughs> and he said, well, I would like to work with you in the Constitutional Affairs Committee in the European Parliament. And so we did. And he did an excellent job there. And I remember once he was appointed rapporteur for a very special report, the report on lobbying. And before the final vote at the committee, I got a phone call from, from him. I was in Madrid. And he said to me, mm, Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend the committee meeting tomorrow. I said, what? I mean, uh, there's the boat going on. I have no idea what's going on. And he explained to me, well, you can't tell anyone, but it is very possible that I become Minister of Foreign Affairs tomorrow. So I have to be in Helsinki and not in Brussels. Well, I couldn't tell anyone. Everybody was saying, but why isn't the rapporteur here? At the end, he was appointed. Minister for Foreign Affairs. Hmm? I was still member of the European Parliament, you know. The others upgrade, I was still there. <laughs> and, and, what was it, four years after, four years after, he phones me and said, well, you know, I'm running for the presidency of my party, Kukumus, and if I win, I'll become Prime Minister of Finland. And then, of course, I said to him, what can I do for you? And he said to me, why don't you send a tweet saying that I am you know, a very good pro-European, a loyal friend, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> My problem was that I was not on Twitter. <laughs> and because, you know, he's He's extraordinary on all these new technologies. I couldn't tell him. So do you know what I did? I registered on Twitter just to send my first tweet saying, ah, you finish. You should vote Alex Stubb. I'm sure it helped a lot. <laughs> I'm convinced it was decisive. Zero followers. <laughs> it was decisive. He was elected, and he became prime minister. Then, as it happens in life, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Now he's the only, only the minister of finance. Uh, because I saw his career mounting, 
I told my prime minister, listen, um, Mr. Rajoy, I mean, I used to be the boss of this guy. Um, I'm only the Secretary of State for European Affairs. You should appoint me minister. <laughs> this was also decisive, and Rajoy did it. <laughs> so I own you a lot. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you will have, as our guest today, uh, a fantastic speaker, someone who's a man of convictions, someone who, who is a pro-European, someone who is a good friend, someone who studied here back in 1995, and someone, and that's, I think, the most important, he met his wife here, who was also a member of the promotion of 1995, and to, to finish the circle, the promotion of 1995, called Ramon Jul, hmm? the person who stand here, was the King of Spain. So you will have the opportunity to listen to him afterwards, but firstly, as we always do, it's our pleasure to call the Burgermeister to take the floor and address this audience. Thank you very much. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, dear students, they gave me five minutes to say welcome. <laughs> so I say welcome. <laughs> but uh, I have another four minutes to explain to you how you can become a member of Bruges, a Brugeling. Four steps to go. First of it, in Bruges, we respect the past and we look to the future. And you can see that in our life as a cultural life. Here, as a member of the college, you have interest to our museums, to this concert hall, and to the concert hall. We want to emphasize that History is important, and what we do is protect our city. In Bruges, you can find the structure of the medieval. We didn't touch on it. We try to live in it, and some makes in Bruges films. But we try to live, and we try to look to the future. You have the possibility until the 18th of October to see our Triennal, the most modern art in an historic city, in the public places. So hurry, if you have time between the courses, you can see modern art in our public places. With one message, respect the past of Europe and look to the future. And the best way to do it is to do it in Bruges, the most beautiful city of Europe. <laughs> Second lesson, there is also economy. And we emphasize on international relations and economy. Therefore, we look to the sea and we have our world harbor, we have our seaport of Bruges, Zeebrugge. I hope you will find the time to look and see how we work there. But more important, third lesson, you have to try to live and speak like the people of Brugge. First of all, I have to apologize that uh, last week I wasn't there for the mayor's drink, but I hope you have had a good introduction. Here we drink beer. And not one beer, several beers. <laughs> and on the other hand, we have a sort of language you have to try to adapt. Because if you want to say, after this beautiful 10 months of your life, I'm from Brugge, you have to pronounce Brugge. You don't say, I'm from Bruges. I've been in Bruges. No, I've been in Brugge. So we try Brugge. Okay. And fourth lesson, the most important, 
We are a city with 170,000 inhabitants, 18,000 live in this historical center, and this historical center has 5 million visitors a year. That means we have 18,000 visitors every year in the zone where 18,000 people lives. We, live, we try to live with everyone, but still we are a little city. And you, as students of the college, we want to make you Bruggeling honoris causa. But therefore, you have the same right as everyone in Bruges. You can phone the mayor. And I say it only once. My cell phone number is <laughs> 0032-475-79-70-73. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Ministre, Ancien Premier Ministre, ancien du Collège, euh, Monsieur le Maire, euh, Excellence, euh, chers collègues et amis, chers étudiants. Avec euh, son choix de Chopin comme patron de promotion pour l'année académique 2015 le Collège d'Europe renoue, après une interruption de plusieurs années, avec sa tradition de rendre hommage aussi à des Européens qui ont marqué ce continent et la contribution de ce continent à l'histoire et la culture de l'humanité à travers les arts, et plus particulièrement dans le, cet art que Georg Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel a considéré la plus haute après la poésie, la musique. Après Mozart, promotion 91-92, et Beethoven, promotion 2005-2006, Chopin est le troisième grand compositeur européen qui donnera son nom à une promotion du collège, une promotion qui se distingue euh, doré et déjà par le fait d'être la plus nombreuse dans l'histoire du collège, avec 479 étudiants. Avant de questionner les raisons de ces choix, Retraçons les étapes principales d'une vie précoce en termes de carrière, mais interrompue brutalement par la maladie. Frédéric Franciszek Chopin est né le 1er mars 1810, selon certaines sources, déjà le 22 février de cette année-ci, ce qui veut dire qu'en Pologne, euh, on réserve toute une semaine, un peu plus, pour euh, célébrer euh, la date de sa naissance, puisqu'on n'est pas entièrement sûr à quelle date il était né. Dans le euh, village de Selazova Vola, situé à environ une cinquantaine de kilomètres à l'ouest de Varsovie. À 50 kilomètres à l'ouest de Varsovie, et donc à peu près presque la même distance de notre campus de Natoline à Varsovie. Il était le deuxième enfant et l'unique fils d'ailleurs de Nicolas Chopin, né en 1771 à Maranville en Lorraine, et de Justina Krizanowska, née en 1782 à Drugi en Kujavi en Pologne. Ayant émigré à Varsovie à l'âge de 16 ans déjà, le père de Chopin s'était vite identifié très fortement à sa nouvelle patrie de Pologne. Il a changé son, nom, son prénom en Mikolai et il s'est engagé déjà sept ans plus tard dans l'insurrection armée en Pologne contre l'occupation russe de 1794. Après la défaite sanglante de cette insurrection, Mikolai parvenait à s'ouvrir une carrière de précepteur dans les milieux aristocratiques euh, polonaises. Il avait acquis 
une culture littéraire française et aussi polonaise allant bien au-delà de l'horizon de ses origines paysannes en France. C'était un autodidacte, un autodidacte qui est allé très loin de s'ouvrir de nouveaux horizons euh, euh, intellectuels. Le père de Chopin avait clairement une ambition euh, sociale et cette ambition fut partagée par sa femme Justina, elle-même fille très bien éduquée d'un noble appauvri, appauvri. Avec un père ayant une vocation d'éducateur exigeant mais bienveillant, et une mère qui savait entourer la famille Chopin, qui euh, comptait, en fond de compte, quatre enfants, qui, euh, qui parvenait euh, de fournir, une mère qui parvenait à fournir, fournir un euh, environnement chaleureux et bien organisé. Euh, le jeune Chopin a vraiment eu une enfance assez euh, heureuse, mais aussi une enfance très stimulante en ce qui concerne sa vocation musicale. C'était sa mère, Justina, qui l'initia, selon différentes sources, déjà à l'âge de 3 ou 4 ans, euh, à l'instrument qui est devenu plus tard son destin, le piano. C'était également sa mère, Justina, qui en premier lieu euh, le familiarisa en chantant avec les traditions musicales populaires danse et chansons qui l'accompagneraient pour toute sa vie. L'ascension sociale de la famille Chopin était assez remarquable pour, euh, pour l'époque, surtout euh, prenant en compte qu'il s'agissait d'un immigrant relativement pauvre. Nicolas passait successivement de simple précepteur à une position d'entendant de domaine, professeur de français des classes basses au lycée de Varsovie. Euh, plus tard, il est devenu euh, professeur à l'école d'ingénieurs et de l'artilleur euh, à Varsovie et finalement professeur des classes hautes en langue et littérature française au lycée de Varsovie. En même temps, les Chopins ont accueilli dans les vastes appartements qui euh, leur étaient accordés euh, dans un palais aristocratique à Varsovie, des pensionnaires du plus haut niveau aristocratique euh, de, la, de la Pologne. Cette euh, amélioration progressive garantissait à la famille Chopin une certaine, disons, aisance bourgeoise, ce qui permettait aux parents d'engager un professeur de piano pour le jeune Frédéric dès l'âge de 6 ans. Ils s'étaient rendus compte que leur fils n'avait pas seulement un intérêt extraordinaire dans les, pour, pour l'instrument, mais aussi un talent très précoce. Le professeur qui fut recruté pour cette tâche d'enseigner le jeune Chopin euh, était d'origine tchèque, euh, avec le nom de Wojciech Sweeney. Il avait le grand mérite d'initier le jeune Chopin à la rigueur méthodique et des compositeurs euh, des compositions de Johann Sebastian Bach et de Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, mais sans étouffer l'esprit explorateur et déjà assez libre de jeune Chopin euh, euh, en ce qui concerne de trouver sa propre voix sur le piano et en ce qui concerne euh, euh, les compositions. Assez souvent, les enseignants ont tendance de présenter des modèles d'une manière assez forte et ne pas laisser assez d'esprit euh, libre aux étudiants. Mais là, le jeune Chopin avait également une chance de ce euh, point de vue. Déjà en 1817, le jeune Chopin composait sa, euh, son première œuvre à l'âge de 7 ans. Une Polonaise en sol mineur euh, qui, est, euh, qui était publiée dans la même année avec le soutien financier d'un ami aristocrate de la famille euh, Chopin. On commence alors déjà à parler d'un jeune génie et le 24 février 1818, à l'âge de 7 ans et demi, Chopin donne son premier concert à la Société de bienfaisance à Varsovie. C'était le début d'une grande carrière de pianiste de concert. C'est également le début d'un tourbillon 
d'un véritable tourbillon de succès, d'audition privée, composition précoce et concert. Il faut dire que les parents du jeune Chopin n'ont pas vu initialement sans méfiance cette, euh, cette évolution, puisqu'ils avaient la crainte qu'une carrière de musicien ne pourrait pas nécessairement se, euh, se donner une assez bonne base pour, pour la vie de, euh, future de, de, de leur enfant. Mais la vocation et les talents de Chopin sont tellement évidents, presque dès les débuts, que les parents euh, s'inclinent. Ils permettent euh, à leur fils d'avoir des enseignants de plus en plus haut euh, euh, niveau, et ils lui, lui assurent, par exemple, à partir de l'âge de 12 ans, des leçons privées, privées également en théorie musicale, par un des professeurs les plus éminents polonais de l'époque. Comparé aux jeunes listes de euh, l'année suivante, euh, le, euh, le jeune Chopin commence euh, à être invité à des occasions de plus en plus brillantes, et est invité, par exemple, en 1825, de jouer devant le tsar. Un exploit assez extraordinaire à, à l'époque. Mais tout cela ne faisait pas tourner la tête au jeune Chopin. Loin de s'enorgueillir de l'attention que lui portent les grands salons de Varsovie, il s'inspire plutôt des impressions simples, proches de la nature et de l'environnement euh, paysan, euh, avec lesquels il entre en contact durant ses vacances d'été. Il aime tout simplement à danser la mazurka et d'écouter les anciennes chansons polonaises. Intégrant l'école supérieure de la musique à partir de 1826, à l'âge de 16 ans, euh, il prend également des leçons et suit des cours d'histoire et de littérature à l'Université de Varsovie. C'est alors que le jeune comme Chopin entre en contact avec euh, les pulsions du romantisme grandissant de, de l'époque, ce qui lui, euh, lui aidera beaucoup à dépasser les contraintes de la musique du classicisme de l'époque. Mais il n'a jamais oublié l'enseignement de, euh, de ses professeurs, surtout en ce qui concerne la nécessité de garder une forme rigoureuse et logique dans ses compositions, il n'a jamais oublié l'exemple de Bach et de Mozart. Suivant le début de sa carrière internationale, en 1829, il donne deux concerts très applaudis lors d'un séjour à Vienne. Et une année plus tard, il a le plus grand succès euh, qu'il a jusqu'à présent eu en Pologne euh, dans un grand concert au Théâtre National euh, le 17 mars 1830. C'est aussi l'époque de la finalisation de sa première grande composition, du concerto en fin euh, euh, mineur et du concerto en mi mineur euh, 1830. Ceci en parallèle au travail sur plusieurs polonaises et mazurkas qui restent très autrement appréciées aujourd'hui. C'est précisément quand même dans cette année 1830, tellement riche en succès, qu'intervient la grande scissure dans la vie de Chopin. Lors d'un deuxième séjour à Vienne, commence la grande insurrection polonaise de décembre 1830, qui l'empêche d'abord, à cause des combats, euh, de revenir euh, en Pologne, et après, après la défaite de l'insurrection, l'oblige euh, à prendre la voie de l'exil. La répression russe est brutale et ferme la porte pour, euh, à la retour de Chopin euh, dans sa Pologne natale. Chopin se trouve à Stuttgart, en Allemagne, en 1831, quand il apprend la nouvelle de la défaite totale de l'insurrection polonaise. Il traverse alors une profonde dépression une dépression allant jusqu'à des visions de solitude extrême et de mort prochaine. De Stuttgart, il se dirige alors vers Paris. Ce Paris, à l'époque, capitale des arts et du romantisme de l'époque, qui lui ouvrira et qui lui offrira une autre vie et des perspectives de rayonnement international 
que sa Pologne natale, opprimée et sous l'occupation russe, n'aura jamais pu lui offrir à l'époque. Paris lui offre une chance, une nouvelle vie, mais cette séparation de sa Pologne natale ouvre une blessure, une blessure qui ne guérira jamais. Très vite, à Paris, je pense se trouve une place d'excellence dans la vie artistique et culturelle. Le 26 février 1832, en concert dans la salle Pleyel, le révèle au grand public parisien et se succèdent alors des invitations dans tout le grand euh, salon euh, de Paris et à des soirées exclusives, ainsi que des sollicitations vraiment sans fin pour donner des cours aux enfants des familles parmi les plus aisées et distinguées de la capitale, ce qui lui d'ailleurs assure pour un certain moment au moins un revenu euh, confortable. Il noue également des liens d'amitié avec Liszt, Hiller, Mendelssohn, Berlioz, Franchamme et d'autres grands compositeurs, et plus tard devient un des amis les, les, plus, les plus proches également du peintre Delacroix. C'est-à-dire, il est vraiment de plus en plus bien intégré dans cette société parisienne. Suit la publication des opus 6 à 32 entre les années 1832 et 1837, dont 21 mazurkas, 10 nocturnes, 24 études, 2 concertos, dans une période très féconde pour la productivité de, euh, de Chopin en tant que compositeur. À la fin des années 30, il est non seulement un pianiste de grand renom, considéré par euh, beaucoup euh, d'experts, de, même les meilleurs, mais également déjà reconnu comme un grand euh, compositeur. Euh, L'intégration artistique et sociale dans le contexte euh, parisien a certainement joué un rôle considérable pour cette décision en septembre 1834 de ne pas réclamer de passeport à l'ambassade de la Russie euh, pour retourner euh, en Pologne. À cette époque, euh, les Tsars avaient proclamé une amnistie pour permettre euh, à certains exilés de rentrer, mais Chopin a pris la euh, décision de ne pas retourner dans cette euh, Pologne sous le joug de la, de la Russie, ce qui lui a euh, fermé euh, pour longtemps les portes de la Pologne. Mais malgré le fait qu'il a peut-être pris cette décision également parce qu'il se sentait bien intégré dans le contexte artistique et social parisien, la patrie polonaise, dans un certain sens perdue, est restée toujours profondément proche à travers les liens qu'il a gardés toujours très vivants avec sa famille, et des amitiés fortes avec des, euh, des Polonais en exil, ainsi qu'à euh, travers les motifs et formes des traditions musicales polonaises qui a toujours gardé, euh, pour lesquelles il a toujours gardé une place très euh, forte et centrale même dans bon nombre de ses compositions. Les années 30 sont aussi très importantes pour la vie sentimentale de Chopin. Pendant un séjour à Dresde, en 1835, il tombe amoureux de Maria Wojcinska, fille de 16 ans, bien éduqué, très sensible, l'admirant, d'une famille de la petite noblesse polonaise, d'une euh, famille de la petite noblesse polonaise de Kujavi. Mais les parents de Maria Wojcinska sont loin d'être convaincus par la perspective de marier leur fille à un prodige de la musique, aux revenus jugés instables et en lien avec le milieu de la bohème artistique de Paris, où il y avait certaines impressions que les mœurs étaient un peu légères. Alors, euh, ce, qui, ce qui a mené à une situation où euh, les parents ont pesé sur euh, Maria de ne pas euh, euh, aller, pour ainsi dire, plus loin avec Chopin, et en 1837, il doit faire face à une rupture définitive, certainement inspirée par, euh, par les parents, ce qui les fera conserver toutes les lettres reçues de Maria dans une enveloppe portant l'inscription manuscrite « Mon amour, mon malheur 
Alors, c'était une, une expérience sentimentale euh, euh, profonde qui, euh, qui s'est traduite dans une, dans une déception. Euh, mais c'est une année après cette grande déception, en printemps 1838, que se noue sa relation avec l'écrivaine Georges Sand. Elle durera neuf ans et sera la plus importante de sa vie. Cette relation avec Georges Sand a fait couler beaucoup d'encre. Il ne manque pas les auteurs qui ont vu Georges Sand comme un facteur assez négatif, certains même euh, cru destructeur dans la vie de Chopin. Il est vrai que Georges Sand, probablement l'intellectuel la plus émancipé dans le sens moderne du terme à son époque, avait une très forte personnalité. Elle était, disons, un peu égocentrique. Elle pourrait être assez capricieuse. Elle était certainement très attachée à sa liberté. Il ne faut pas oublier non plus que sa décision, la décision de Georges Sand de rupture avec Chopin en 1847, était au moins en partie motivée par sa perception que Chopin, de plus en plus souffrant et cherchant un rôle dans la relation entre Georges Sand et ses deux enfants, était devenu, de son point de vue, trop encombrant. Mais il faut également pleinement reconnaître que ce fameux couple Chopin-Sand s'est basé sur une passion mutuelle très forte, un très grand respect et une très forte admiration des qualités artistiques et intellectuelles de l'autre et d'une vraie volonté, au moins initiale, de se construire en vie euh, ensemble. Ce qui était démontré, je pense par exemple, par le fait qu'ils ont passé quelques mois dans des circonstances matérielles assez difficiles à Majorque dans l'hiver 1838-39. Il avait une volonté vraiment de se construire une vie ensemble. Durant plusieurs années, la relation avec Georges Sand a procuré à Chopin un cadre émotionnel relativement stable et réconfortant. Je pense que ce n'est pas par hasard que la plupart de ses œuvres opus 33 à 65, finalisées entre 1838 et 1847, une phase particulièrement féconde de son travail, ont été composées à la propriété de Georges Sand à Nouan, en Andre et en Loire, en France. C'est dans cette chambre que Georges Sand euh, avait aménagée pour Chopin, la chambre la plus ensoleillée de la propriété de Nouan, et où elle avait fait venir en secret, en tant que surprise pour lui, un piano de la fameuse maison Playel, dans cette chambre où Chopin a composé quelques-uns de ses plus magnifiques euh, œuvres. Les années 40 voient Chopin au plus haut de la, sa carrière de pianiste, avec des concerts triomphaux, euh, surtout le 26 avril 1840 et le 16 février 1848, comme point culminant. Ce n'est pourtant pas dans le cadre des grands concerts publics que Chopin a excellé le plus. D'ailleurs, il a dit, écrit plusieurs fois, qu'au fond, il n'a jamais aimé les grandes occasions. Et parfois, il a même haï de devoir jouer devant des grandes audiences. C'est plutôt dans le contexte plus intime des salons et des soirées entre ses amis que la magique de Chopin en tant que pianiste s'est pleinement développé. Je cite Robert Schumann, compositeur Robert Schumann, qui a laissé ses témoignages assez émouvants. Citation, « Quel tableau inoubliable que de voir Chopin assis à son piano tel qu'un clairvoyant, perdu dans ses rêves, de voir comment il communiquait ses visions dans son interprétation et comment, à la fin de chaque morceau, il avait la triste habitude de promener son doigt tout le long du clavier plantif comme il cherchait à s'arracher de son rêve. Cette magique, on ne pourra jamais la revivre, ses compositions ont été préservées, mais naturellement, sa manière très spécifique de jouer, ça, malheureusement, on a perdu pour, pour toujours. Alors, ces témoignages sont très précieux. C'est également dans cette dernière décade de sa vie que Chopin crée ses œuvres les plus originales et émouvantes. 
dans la tonalité sentant de la sombre et profonde sonate en si bémol mineur, opus 45, à la, jusqu'à la très lumineuse barcarolle, opus 60, euh, pleine de reflets vraiment ensoleillés, de bonheur autour d'une barque naviguant dans les eaux de Venise. Si vous avez l'occasion de, d'écouter une euh, interprétation de cette barcarolle, euh, ça vous donne une idée que Chopin, qui est parfois présenté comme quelqu'un de relativement mélancolique de nature, pourrait vraiment euh, exprimer des sentiments très forts, très lumineux de, de bonheur également. Mais c'est aussi la période de cet immense, d'une apparence toujours très soignée d'ailleurs, je pense, dépenser une véritable fortune pour ses gants. On dit euh, probablement que c'est un bon investissement, puisqu'en tant que pianiste, ses doigts, naturellement, <rire> avaient certainement euh, euh, besoin d'être particulièrement protégés. C'est euh, durant cette époque que Chopin doit déjà de plus en plus lutter contre la tuberculose. Euh, dans les premiers symptômes, c'était d'ailleurs déjà déclaré quand il était encore dans son enfance. Rongé par la toux, des, euh, euh, les problèmes respiratoires, il avait très souvent des attaques d'asphyxie, les effusions de sang et l'amaigrissement progressif, la force de ses doigts magiques, euh, commençait euh, à, à décliner. En voyage de six mois en 1948 en Angleterre et puis en Écosse, l'affaiblit encore plus. Et quand il retourne à Paris en novembre 1848, une longue et éprouvante agonie commence avec, pour seule consolation, la présence de sa sœur Ludwika dans les dernières semaines. Il s'éteint le 17 octobre 1849, à 2 heures du matin, au 12 Place Vendôme euh, à Paris. Dans sa brève solennité, c'est peut-être le mot, je cite encore, de Robert Schumann, prononcé lors des obsèques, qui résume le plus les sentiments de ses admirateurs dans toute l'Europe à l'époque. Je cite, « L'âme de la musique a passé sur le monde ». Selon le dernier vœu de Chopin, son corps est inhumé à Paris, mais son cœur transféré à Varsovie. Chopin a donc deux tombeaux aujourd'hui, l'un au cimetière du Père Lachaise à Paris et l'autre dans un pilier de la basilique de la Sainte-Croix à Varsovie, un symbole de sa vie partagée entre sa Pologne natale et la France en tant que terre d'exil. Let us get back now in the final shorter part of um, my presentation to the question why Chopin merits and actually more than merits to give his name to this promotion. There are three reasons at least. The first is that through his compositions Chopin translated the musical traditions, the culture and also the political plight of his native Poland into a musical language and a musical message which reached out and has been understood across all European borders and well beyond ever since. It is often said that one of Europe's major strengths resides precisely in the rich diversity of different national cultures, histories and identities a diversity which often has been also a powerful obstacle to deeper European integration. I think this argument that the true richness of Europe resides in its diversity carries a lot of strength. But national diversity, to be constructive and fruitful, needs to involve the opening up of national cultures and identities to each other, to allow them to enrich in, to enrich in each other mutually and to reach via a merger and transformation common higher levels of human endeavor um, through synergy across national borders. Not only through his mazurkas and polonaise, but also other compositions such as the famous Etude Revolutionnaire, Opus 10, uh, number 12, Chopin made 
essential cultural and historical experiences as well as deep emotions of his native Poland accessible to interpreters and listeners in all Europe and beyond. He did so by merging essentially Polish elements of form and composition while uh, preserving um, their essence with those of other European traditions, including those of his favorite predecessors, Bach and Mozart, to arrive at a highly sophisticated and original musical language which has become part of the common European heritage and continues to touch European as well as non-European hearts and minds to the present day. Chopin provides one of the foremost examples of a European artist rendering specific national traditions and emotions accessible, intelligible, and a source of inspiration across borders. And this makes him an outstanding patron de promotion for the College of Europe, which has always aimed at making its students, you students of the college, understand that it is a cross-border synergy of the European nations which constitutes Europe's greatest potential and real strengths. The second reason for our choice is that Chopin, through his compositions, has gone beyond the limits of the musical traditions of his time, acquiring forever a place among those Europeans having transcended the given, the existing, for, open, for the opening up of new horizons. He has been a great innovator, both as regards the form and the content of his compositions. As regards the form, he used dissonances in a revolutionary, impressionistic way, overcoming the former more tension orientation in favor of a positive, message-carrying, stylistic element. He also went beyond the established musical form conventions of his time by sudden key changes and innovative modulations. It was him who effectively established the prelude as a musical genre of its own, who developed the nocturne to a form of extraordinary sophistication and used for the first time ballade and scherzi as individual concert compositions. But Chopin was even more innovative and even more revolutionary with regard to the content of his works. No other composer before him, and few, if any, after him, has succeeded in expressing through sheets of music such an extraordinary range of emotions, often reaching the deepest region of human feeling. Be it elation or melancholy, optimism or dejection, humor or philosophical reflection. His 20 nocturnes, for instance, each constitute a different emotional world expressed in a melancholic lyricism of great uh, rhythmical freedom and dramatic reach. The 24 prelude, opus 28, explore as many different facets of the human soul and mind in miniatures of an unparalleled, partly dreamy, partly passionate poetic quality. Few composers ever has reached, have reached his capacity to express individual feelings through music with such depth and complexity, without ever gliding into the obscure, with such liberty and honesty, without ever giving up on stringent form and logic of expression, and with such force of emotional expression, without ever becoming oppressively intense and heavy. Chopin has moved the borderlines of the possible, of musical expression at his time, and he has helped countless composers after him to dare to go further with using music to communicate the deeper emotions of the individual to all those open to a wider human experience and understanding. The third reason, and not the least one, from the perspective of an academic institution as ours is that Chopin was a great and deeply committed teacher. Over large parts of his career in Paris, he devoted often several hours each day to teaching his carefully selected pupils the instrument at which he excelled. Lessons to be scheduled to last only 45 minutes or an hour could often run into several hours with the most talented. He would normally show great patience and also lots of politeness to his pupils, but he could also become irritable 
with the most gifted of his pupils if he felt that they were not applying themselves sufficiently. Far from focusing only on a formal technical training, he wanted his pu pupils first to understand the structural logic and the meaning of a work before starting to play it. We hope that the professors at the College of Europe also focus in the first place on the meaning and then on the technical aspects. He also allowed them to play works differently from himself, encouraging them to find their own way on the piano as long as their inter interpretation and technique was rigorous uh, enough and faithful to the substance of the work. He always told his students, don't think about the audience, think about yourself. To develop his pupil's touch was, one of the great, was of the greatest importance to him, and he did his best to teach him to fall on and caress the keys of the piano rather than striking and hitting them. Trying to pass on to others the best of what one knows and can do is amongst the nobles, the most noble of human aspirations. Chopin, therefore, merits our greatest respect also as a genius who worked very hard to enable his pupils to take at least some steps towards his unequaled mastery of the piano. I wish to close these reflections on Chopin with a personal recollection. I was 14 years of age when I was first taken to the Père Lachaise uh, Cemetery to visit it. The Père Lachaise Cemetery a landscape of memory full of dark, often monumental stones, dark trees, and cold marble. I will never forget that there was one colorful spot only in one part of the cemetery, rendered warm and to some extent even living by small bunches of flowers. And this was the tomb of Chopin with the delicate marble profile of Chopin on its front panel. These flowers you can still find today always renewed in various colors and arranged with great care. This extraordinary attachment to Chopin, I tend to think, is not only an expression of admiration for his genius, but also one of real love for his music and the emotion it still inspires. And this love is a reflection of the immense emotional effort, and why not call it also love, as well, which Chopin put into his compositions, working sometimes for weeks on a single sheet of notes until he felt that he had expressed as best as he could the emotions he wanted to uh, communicate through the respective piece, moods and insights which go still to the core of human existence. He gave nearly all of himself to uh, his music, his playing, having listened to him playing Jane Welch Carlyle, the wife of the historian um, Thomas Carlyle, wrote in a letter to Chopin's pupil Jane Sterling in July 1848 that each part of his music seemed to her, I cite, a portion of his soul and life given away by him, spent on those who have ears to hear and hearts to understand adding that she felt that every piece he composes must leave Chopin with many fewer days to live. The flowers on the Père Lachaise are just one of many indications that this exhausting work of love of Chopin, aimed at touching his listeners in interpreters and sharing something of considerable depth with them, is forever fulfilling its purpose. Well, dear students of the Chopin Promotion, all of us here from the College of Europe, we wish you the same, reaching out across borders, the same creativity to go beyond the existing, and the same love for your work and for being understood by others, for which your patron has set such an illustrious example. Thanks very much.
Sometimes words cannot simply explain the important things in life, especially when compared with sublime music. And this is why Stefania Sudace will now play for us all two works from, from Chopin. Ms. Sudace, a citizen of Rome, Bruges, and Europe, not only happens to be a professional piano player and composer, but also a political science graduate, and most importantly, an alumna of the College of Europe. Back in 2001, as part of the Aristote promotion, she received her master's degree in European political studies. Back in Italy, she worked as a journalist and as a researcher in economic and social matters. But she never quit her passion for, uh, for music, as much as she never forgot the College of Europe. For this, thank you, Ms. Sudace. Please welcome home Ms. Stefania Sudace. Je voulais vous présenter très simplement les deux morceaux de Chopin que j'aurai l'honneur de jouer pour vous dans quelques instants. Ils font partie d'un cycle de compositions conçu par Chopin entre 1836 et 1839, les préludes. Ce sont des pages musicales autonomes qui, malgré leur dénomination de prélude, ne sont pas une introduction à quelque chose d'autre. Il s'agit en fait de morceaux qui ont un sens fini et accompli en eux-mêmes et dont la beauté peut être perçue de façon incentive, selon l'imagination de celui qui joue et de celui qui écoute. Le premier que je vais exécuter est le prélude numéro 13 en fa dièse majeur. C'est une méditation profonde et sereine qui se termine avec un chant à deux voix qui inspire la plus profonde tendresse. Le deuxième sera le prélude numéro 15, en Ré bémol majeur. Ici, le chant est très proche d'un nocturne. La main gauche, dans son accompagnement presque hypnotique, garde le rythme avec rigueur, alors que la main droite a plus de liberté dans l'interprétation de la mélodie. C'est le fameux rubato de Chopin. Aussi, dans ce prélude, il y a un contraste très fort entre le thème principal, très clair, calme et doux, et la section centrale, qui par contre est obscure et dramatique. En même temps, ce contraste est très harmonieux. Il va se résoudre dans les dernières mesures de la composition avec un retour au thème principal. Des thèmes délicats, des harmonies magiques, j'ai donc essayé de vous présenter avec ces quelques mots le morceau que vous allez écouter, consciente du fait que la parole face à la musique est toujours limitée, très limitée. Et c'est notamment vrai quand on se retrouve face à quelque chose de sublime comme c'est le piano de Chopin. Je vous souhaite une très bonne écoute.
Thanks to our ancien for this splendid uh, uh, playing of uh, Chopin. I would now like to invite uh, Minister Stubb to uh, present his uh, keynote address for today. I would like to add that as a minister, he is always under time pressure and he will unfortunately not have uh, so much time afterwards to stay with us. But a great many thanks on behalf of the college that you have accepted to come today. Please, the floor is all yours. Mr. President, Mr. Burgmeister, Mr. Rector, <laughs> you know, after Chopin, Stubb, really thrilling. Must be also looking around, what the hell is this guy doing up here? It's really nice to be here, but you know, listening to Inigo earlier, he didn't tell you the whole story. You know, Inigo is a great speaker, right? He was in the parliament, and you know, when you're in the parliament, you usually speak your mother tongue. We have 23 languages being interpreted simultaneously. And one time, Inigo was speaking of a paper. Then he deviated from the paper. He put it on the side. And the interpreter got a little bit baffled. He said, uh, Inigo started to tell a joke. And you know, jokes and interpretation. Uh. <laughs> Fortunately, there was a really smart interpreter in the booth, a female, of course, <laughs> said, uh, at the moment, Deputé Mendes de Vigo is telling a joke. I cannot translate it, but I would really appreciate it if you could all laugh now. Je sais bien que je dois m'exprimer en deux langues, mais je veux donner ce discours plutôt en anglais. Pourquoi Parce que je suis un barbare du Nord. Je parle français comme une vache espagnole, pardon. Je viens de dire cette blague une fois avec euh, Madame Brick, qui était l'ancien ministre de commerce de la France. Elle a dit, mais Monsieur Stubb, c'est une insulte pour des vaches. <rire> Merci. C'est comme ça, c'est l'humeur française. Um, it, it's, it's great to be here. This is going to be a very personal speech. Um, don't hold my government accountable for it. I have written it, and I've actually, un it's quite unusual, I've written a speech myself. I'm not going to read it off a paper, we're going to distribute it uh, around later on. But it's personal for many reasons. One of them is that this is a very special place for me. Uh, and there are really two special people here around me as well. Um, one of them is Professor Brent Nelson, who is uh, sitting over there. He's from Furman University, where I started my academic career in 1989. And the other one is Inigo Mendes de Vigo, who actually took me under his wings um, in the European Parliament in 2004. We had done a lot of work on uh, differentiated integration, actually, previously, before I told him, stop. Uh, and it, it's really a privilege to be able to speak here in, in front of the college uh, with these two people present. It's also a special place because, uh, yes, indeed, I, I did meet my wife here. Suzanne, a Brit, good looking. I always say that. Uh, we stayed at Golden Hanstrat. <laughs> how many you how many of you at Golden Hanstrat? Yeah. Is bar night still on Wednesdays? Yeah, sorry I have to catch a plane, otherwise, you know, it would be great timing, but uh, it, was, it was a wonderful, wonderful place. And I also remember, actually vividly, the opening ceremony. To be quite honest, it was a bit stiff during my days. Uh, but but um, for some reason, I was, <laughs> I was wearing a bow tie, you know, one of those things, right? And then it was early in the season, so, you know, Suzanne and I hadn't really bumped into each other. But I had sort of, you know, had my eyes. And, oh, looks good. And, and, and she came up to me and said, hey, really nice bow tie, Alex. And I was like, hey, this is great, you know. <laughs> She likes me. Later on, when we started dating, she said, you look like an ass, you know? <laughs> so, so I haven't worn a bow tie since, I, 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 must, I must admit. Suzanne, of course, was a lawyer. I was just a humble political scientist. Uh, uh, she was and is smarter than I am. Uh, but, um, and, and she did read through the speech as well, so I was allowed to say that. Um, we nowadays live in Finland, we have two kids, um, life is good and dandy, but this speech is not about the College of Love. Uh, it's not going to be stand-up comedy either, uh, but it will be about the future of 
the European Union. Uh, and just in the beginning, I, I want to say that, that your experience here at college, my, I only have one piece of advice, you know, work hard, play hard, which basically means that, you know, work your butt off in the library, do your work, get your thesis done on time, start thinking about it already, start doing the drafts, don't faff around, but on Wednesdays go to the bar. Uh, the national parties, they're going to be great. We had a Viking party um, with the Nordics. We served a whole bunch of little vodkas before. <laughs> you know, Spaniards couldn't hack it. They were all completely hammered <laughs> you know, right in the beginning. You know. <laughs> they were gone. Uh, so if you do the same thing, you know, go for it. Uh, early off, uh, it's cheaper for the party it, itself. Uh, so play hard, work hard. You learn a lot about the EU institutions. Uh, is Jacquet still teaching here? Yeah. Oh my god. <laughs> He's fantastic, but he's probably got the worst jokes in the world, right? Yeah, he's, he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant uh, for a lawyer, I say. Um, uh, what I'm going to do today is basically try to suss out um, uh, five um, sort of points or, or, or run you through uh, the future of Europe through five points. The first one is very personal because I, I want you to understand my background and why I stand here and, and, and the way in which I sort of utter a few words. Secondly, I'll say a few general words uh, about European uh, integration. And a lot of it that I'm gonna say probably will sound familiar to you if you read integration theory uh, and other things. Then I will focus on three things because I, I think the three things that are key during your academic career are also the defining moment for Europe, and I will stress this. Number one is the Euro crisis, number two is the refugee crisis, and number three is security. Uh, in a broad sense. I'll then wrap up uh, in the conclusion by basically um, giving three uh, theses or, or, or three conclusions. So first personal, then general, then Euro, then refugees, then security, and then a conclusion. I'll try to wrap it up by <coughs> four o'clock because I have a 1755 flight. Um, disclaimer number one on the general side. I'm, I'm an avid pro-European. Uh, you know, some people call me a federalist, but I, I don't care, I don't take it as an insult, uh, I take it as a compliment, but I'm not an academic, so for me, um, academic categorizations don't always feel very uh, comfortable. Um, for me, it all began in the United States, that's uh, where I started my studies, uh, in 1989 at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Uh, and and uh, that was in the midst of the Cold War, end of the Cold War, and the reunification of Germany. Remember the 25th anniversary taking place uh, just a few days back. It was big motion uh, in international relations and in international politics. I, I got really excited about integration theories. You know, Ernst Haas, functionalism. Uh, you know, Andrew Moravchik, liberal intergovernmentalism. I used to not agree with him, but nowadays I sort of do. Um, uh, Leon Lindbergh, uh, neo-functionalism, or, or, or John Pinder, federalism. And I, I decided at that moment, you know, I want to become an integration theorist. This is my thing. I'm going to get my PhD, which I eventually did at the London School of Economics. I, I did it on flexible integration, uh, not on integration theory as such. But it was always part of my DNA, and I, I really loved it. For me, I, mean, I was a firm believer in European integration. As it happened, uh, Finland started the process of uh, joining the European Union um, actually in 1992, 1993, and then we joined in 1995. So being in, at the college in 1994, 1995 was really exciting if you were a Finn, if you were a Norwegian, or if you were a Swede, because all three of us had referenda in the fall of 1994. Finland voted yes, Sweden voted yes, and unfortunately Norway <laughs> voted no. But this was where it all started. But quite soon I sort of noticed that, hey, you know, this academic stuff is great, you know, you can write books and articles, and I actually still believe that there's no more noble profession than teaching the young, but I also felt, felt I had an urge to do something else, and uh, I became a civil servant, uh, and I was involved in negotiating three intergovernmental conferences, uh, Amsterdam, Nice, and, and Lisbon. That's kind of where we also met with, um, with Inigo. Um, and I felt that it was good to mix the sort of 
the, the, the theory and the practice. Bruges was very instrumental for me. Uh, it, was, it was sort of the final note that, hey, this is my thing. I, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit sad. I, I get kicks out of European integration. Uh, and, and, but I really loved it. It was, it was one of those things that, you know, this is what I want to do. Uh, and I, I went on for it. Um, I even taught here at Bruges, actually, from 2000 to 2007, which was very inspiring. Uh, because then it forced you to come back to the academic world and talk to students and, and, and get your bearings uh, right. Uh, I was never supposed to go into politics, actually. Uh, and 12 years ago, I did take that, or 11 years ago, the big step. I ran in the European Parliament elections, went to the European Parliament, and then later, four years later, becoming a, a minister. Uh, I, I was never supposed to go into national politics either, but, uh, you know, fate had it. My predecessor had to resign and I had to go, 24 hours to decide. I haven't looked back since. But it's been really interesting to be a minister um, of a government. I, I started in April 2008. Lehman Brothers came in 2008, September, and we basically had crappy economic times ever since. So, uh, you know, I don't know if it's my fault or whoever's, uh, but the truth is that, that Europe has always been a big part of whatever I've done, either as Minister for Foreign Affairs, Minister of Trade, uh, or uh, Prime uh, Minister or now, now uh, finance minister, and after this sort of 25 years of, of a hybrid, you know, oscillating between academia, diplomacy, and, and politics, you know, I, I think the conclusion that I have about European integration is, is, is actually quite mundane. It's that we're in constant crisis management. You know, we move from one crisis to another, and the pattern is pretty strange. At first there's a crisis, then there's general mayhem, like, what the hell are we going to do? And then finally, there's a solution. That's how it works. It's sort of a no solution is never uh, a solution. And there's always some kind of a crisis on. I'm not saying I'm getting cynical. Quite the contrary. My European ideals are still there. But I do believe uh, that, that from this constant management, we always find a solution. And it's never a perfect solution. Uh, it's never a perfect solution. You, you know, you're going to look into academic articles here about federalism, functionalism, neo-functionalism, and the rest of it, and you're going to understand that it's never going to be a finalized product. But the EU does exist, I would argue, for three reasons, and they are peace, prosperity, and security. Peace, prosperity, and security. And around that, we have basically built the whole European Union. And that's when I get to my second part uh, of the lecture, away from the personal, more towards uh, the general. I believe that the European Union is the most successful experiment at managing relations uh, between nation state. Most successful experiment on managing relations between nation states. All the way from the 1950s, coal and steel, up through the Customs Union in the 60s, internal market, and European Union in the 1990s up to today. Now, there are many ways of trying to explain the EU. In today's world, I guess, if the EU was a hashtag, it would be, I don't know, freedom. If it was an app, it would be probably tolerance. Well, if it was a tweet, it would be you know, 140 characters, I guess. Uh, but it's much, much more complex than that. And one of the things I got from my class with Bridget Laffan, who's not here anymore, an Irish professor, she always said, Alex, the EU is more than an international organization, but less than a state. More than an international organization, less than a state. I think that's quite a good way of putting it. It's strange that the EU has exclusive competence in competition. You're going to have the lawyers who love competition policy, right? Cora was here when did competition. Has exclusive competence in monetary policy, exclusive competence in trade, exclusive competence uh, in agriculture, and exclusive competence in customs. Now, we pool sovereignty, but we haven't pooled sovereignty because we think it's fun. We've done it because we have common values, liberal democracy, social market economy, whatnot. We've pooled sovereignty because it's in our interest. We know that a nation state alone cannot anymore deliver the goods of a welfare state, was it not for European integration. EU law stands above national law. 
where the EU has competence and where it has legislated, I add as a humble political scientist. Uh, the European Court of Justice molds the whole legislative, legislative landscape uh, of Europe. We've seen some major decisions just in the past two days on data protection, uh, for instance. The EU is the biggest economy in the world, and don't let anyone tell you different. The United States is not the biggest economy in the world. It's about 20%. The EU is about 22, 23. China is about 10. Russia is about 3% of world GDP. The EU is the biggest economy in the world. We're based on the four freedoms, freedom of the goods, services, labor, and money, albeit sometimes it feels that we try to put up artificial impediments uh, around them. Uh, I've always also believed in a functional way that integration in one area has led to pressure to integrate uh, in another. So you move from a free, tra free trade zone to a customs union, to a single market, to a monetary union, and to a uh, common currency. But I don't think that the EU will ever have a finalité politique. It'll never have an end state. It'll always be more than an international organization, but less than a state. It's not that I don't want it to have one. Yes, I would like to see an end state. But the truth is that we don't have a common vision. The UK views European integration in a different way than France does. Germany views it differently than Sweden and Finland probably views it slightly different than, say, Italy. So we're not going to have a common vision or a finalité. It's not ideal. I think we should have one. And at the same time, I guess I'm worried about democratic legitimacy. I'm worried that a lot of the power lies in the hands of the European Union. Look what we did with Greece this summer. It wasn't exactly the Greek government decided on pensions or welfare reform or labor reform. It was the Euro countries and institutions. At the same time, the final say on budgets, for instance, or on taxes, lies in the hands of member states. So it's not ideal. Uh, but it's not uncommon. Industrial democracies, liberal democracies such as the US or Canada, uh, Japan or Australia, I think they are all, in one way or another, suffering similar dilemmas that we do. People feel detached from the system. I'm also worried about internal isolation inside the European Union. And the biggest worry I have right now uh, is the British referendum and the debate on Brexit. I think it would be a travesty if the UK were to live, leave the European Union. And it would not only be a travesty to the UK, but to the European Union as well. We would be much weaker, the UK would be much weaker, and I would also argue that economically it would not be good. So there are a lot of big things going on. And that's why I'm really happy to stand here, the year of Chopin, in front of your academic year. Because you're entering this academic year at an extremely interesting time. And I wouldn't have said this in 2005. Probably didn't say it necessarily in 1995 either, apart from the fact that we joined the EU, so it was interesting for me. But you stand here, I think, at a defining moment in the history of Europe. A similar defining moment that we had in 1950 with the coal and steel community in the post-World War II era. A similar defining moment that we had in 1990, post-Cold War, and the reunification of Germany, and the integration of Central and Eastern European states into Europe. Now, of course, the three big crises that we have at hand are colossal. The Euro, refugees, and security. And all of these are very linked to the fundamentals of the European Union, to peace, to prosperity, and to security. My answer, obviously, is that we need more integration, not less integration. The paradox, of course, is that we have a lot of populist movements who would probably want less integration, not more integration. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. Uh, I also think that we're looking at issues of balance of power between member states, between member states and institutions, and between the institutions. And I foresee my final point on the general side, that we're not going to take a quantum leap towards some kind of a federative state. 
uh, will continue to muddle through. Now, the three points that I wanted to make today, as I take my spa water. <coughs> this is good stuff, by the way. Uh, much better than, sorry, uh, the tap water in Bruges. Uh, but, uh, but it's Belgian, anyway, you know, Ardennes. Good. Was this a commercial? No. I, there are other good waters as well, you know. <laughs> Brut is very good. Okay, so the three points I wanted to make. The first one is on the Euro, second one on refugees, and the third one on, on security. And then I'll let you out of your misery. Uh, on the Euro, uh, a lot of people think that the root of the crisis was Lehman, Lehman Brothers 2008. It wasn't. The root of the crisis was Maastricht when there was a separation between monetary policy and economic policy. When you do that for political reasons, which I think are at the end of the day understandable, uh, you do a detachment or a divorce of two elements which usually are together. So monetary policy goes to the ECB, economic policy stays in the hands of uh, the member states. Um, it all went well until we started to violate the rules, uh, the Stability and Growth Pact, which was violated, by the way, by France uh, and Germany uh, in 2003, and then a whole bunch of statistical violations coming from uh, other member states. Uh, now, I got pretty scared during the Euro crisis. It wasn't so much, of course I was scared about this as well, taxpayers' money, but it's, I think, in many ways, was about the whole future of the European project. There were moments in 2009 to 2013 when I wasn't sure that we were going to pull through, and there were moments actually this summer uh, when I was fearing uh, Grexit um, in the midst uh, of the crisis. It was really a tough time. But the interesting thing is, again, remember, crisis, mayhem, solution. If someone would have told me six, seven years ago that we're going to have a Fiscal compact, stability mechanisms, resolution fund, six-pack, two-pack legislation, quantitative easing, emerging liquidity assets, or that I would be listening to the Commission talking about the upcoming Spanish budget and giving advice on that, I would have said, nah, not in your wildest federalist dreams. But that's basically what's happened. Again, it's been a game of give and take. It's been a game of trying to find solutions in different times. Now, the two documents, again, and you should be thinking about thesis here. You know, think thesis. <laughs> um, the two documents that are really interesting about the future of the euro, one is the blueprint, which was put forward, um, the lead taken by, by Herman van Rompuy in 2012 uh, on the future of the euro. Um, it went quite far and people sort of got a little bit worried. And the second one is the five presidents' reports, which came out uh, this summer. And in the five presidents' report, basically there are four unions. Economic union, financial union, fiscal union, and political union. Now, as much as I would like to move on to fiscal union and political union, I'm a bit of a realist. So I say that at this stage we should focus on the financial union, which is separated into two parts. One is banking union and the other one is capital markets union. And I think we should look at that and try to deepen that as far as we possibly can. Once we get our own backyard in order with the banks, I think we can start looking at uh, insurance deposit schemes and we can start looking at backstops. But we need to get things right first. So my guess is that during your time here, the focus is going to be very much on banking union, capital markets union, a little bit less on fiscal uh, and uh, political union. Now, uh, with the rest of the stuff, I'll come back to you in 2025, but I'm just a little bit worried that we're not going to, you know, the commission and the five presidents report suggest that we do this in two stages, first practical deepening by 2017 and then some kind of a blueprint fiscal union, political union in 2025. Uh, I just don't see that happening, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your, your take. So I would focus on the euro right now on those two issues. I don't think we're out yet, but I think we're pretty close. The second issue I wanted to touch uh, upon today on the substance is, is refugees. I mean, <sighs> I, I was speaking to colleagues yesterday, among others, Wolfgang Schäuble, and, and he put it quite well. 
uh, he said that it, this is probably the most severe crisis or the most difficult issue that he has faced in his political career. And his political career is a lot longer than mine. I, by the way, wrote uh, my master's thesis here at Bruges on the Schäuble and Lamas paper from the 1st of September 1994, which talked about differentiation uh, of uh, the Eurozone. But it's a big thing. We've all seen heart-wrenching, sad, shocking images of children drowning, of barbed fences, of people walking through Europe, trying to find some kind of destination, not really sure where they're going. We have over a million refugees roaming around in Europe at this particular moment, and there are more coming. And I think this is very much a defining moment for Europe. When I became a student at the college, we were really trying to struggle to find issues to, to discuss. It was about competitiveness. It was about the institutions. But this is about people. And it's one of those moments that it can either go well or it can go horribly, horribly wrong. If it goes well, I think it's great for Europe. It's great for human beings and refugees. If it goes bad, I really don't have an answer what will happen. And I think we should deal with this crisis with a warm heart and a cool head. It's extremely sensitive. And it can go either way. And it can go either way, anytime. I think we should help people. We must help people. There's absolutely no other solution. I also don't think that there are national solutions to the refugee crisis. There are only European solutions to the, to, uh, the refugee crisis. And I don't think any country should be left alone in this particular question. Not those countries which are entry points, not those countries which are transit countries, and not those countries which are endpoints for the refugees. I'll just give you one example of a country I know well, Finland. We usually have approximately 3,000 refugees a year. Last week, we had 3,000 refugees. The week before that, we had 3,000 refugees. And the week before that, we had 3,000 refugees. Usually, we get 3,000 a year. This year, because it started in the summer, we'll have 50,000. And we're not alone in this. There are countries who have much more, either in proportion or otherwise. I make five suggestions or solutions in the refugee crisis. Number one is relocation. I think it was good that Europe took a decision on relocation. And I know you're probably going to say, why did Finland abstain in the voting? It was for party political reasons inside the government. But we were the first country to say that we will take our 2,500 out of the relocation quota. And we will do so in the f future as well. We just couldn't vote with it. But the decision was taken, and that's good, because we need to do burden share. That's not all. Number two, we need hotspots, which are basically refugee centers at the entry points where we deal with the applications. Number three, we need to have a common list of secure countries. So if Afghanistan is a secure country for, say, Portugal, then it should be a secure country for Greece as well. Or if Iraq is a secure country for Sweden, then it should be a secure country for Germany as well. Number four, we need better external border controls, basically more money to Frontex. I understand this is a very difficult issue to deal with, but it has to be dealt with in one way or another. And then fifthly, we need to cooperate with Afghanistan, Iran, and Syria, and the kinds of countries where the refugees are coming from. But the bottom line is, and this is my punchline, I guess, on refugees, we need to harmonize asylum policy. And I know that Jörg Mornar has worked a lot with justice and home affairs over the years and is a much better ex uh, expert at this. But we need to harmonize our asylum policy. And the interesting thing that's going to happen if we start doing that, for instance, the remuneration of asylum seekers, that will bring a social security aspect uh, into the European Union, which we haven't seen before, because it's always been in the domain of the member states. But why should we remunerate 
asylum seekers with the same money because otherwise we're faced with uh, asylum shopping and I don't think that's the right way to go about it. And I don't think the asylum seekers should be blamed for it. I do exactly the same thing. And I think this is a very timely reminder of the 25th anniversary of German reunification. I think Europe is about tolerance. I think Europe is about open borders. I do not think that Europe uh, is about fences in any way or another. Then finally, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a few words on um, security. Uh, I will touch upon this very briefly for time reasons, but you will see it in the written speech. Uh, the international security situation is, is, I think, in quite a terrible state. You look at the Middle East, you look at Ukraine, uh, you look at the hopes that we had with the Arab Spring, you look at terrorism in Europe and outside of uh, Europe. Uh, on foreign policy, when a Finn is standing on a podium, everyone thinks, can you say a couple of words on Russia? And I will. We have 1,300 kilometers, 300 kilometers of border, land border with Russia. That's more than double the EU combined. We've always had very good relations uh, with Russia, and it's in our vested interest that Russia works with the West and with Europe. That's the mindset that we have. Two things. I belong to the category of uh, international optimists or idealists who believe that Medvedev and early 2008 to 2004 would bring the reset button and things would work out well. It didn't, and I think we should admit that many of us were wrong. At the same time, uh, I was the first one after the war of Georgia to come out with a speech saying that this is the return of power politics and spheres of interest uh, to the borders of Europe. Uh, and I didn't want to be right or correct on that, but I think Ukraine proved uh, us and me right. The problem is that Russia has very unstable borders right now. There are six frozen conflicts. Nagorno Karabakh, Transnistria um, are examples. Uh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia are examples. Uh, and then, of course, the Crimean Peninsula and East Ukraine uh, are examples. Some kind of a solution will have to be found. At the same time, I don't like those people who criticize European foreign policy for being toothless. It's not. It actually works as well as it possibly could, I would argue. I think Iran is a case in point. I think the crisis in Ukraine was a case in point. We stayed unified. The, th the difference is that the only instrument that we can use is basically soft power or money or economic power or diplomatic power and negotiation. And I think we actually use that quite well. Um, so on the security front, I think we need to keep on uh, working together. Then I come to my conclusion and, and, and final points. Um, during your academic year, I think that the EU is more relevant than ever. So in many ways, I, I, I think that you're quite lucky. You're coming into a college which is very practical in its approach, and you're dealing with very practical issues at a very interesting time. If you look at the EU, I would argue that peace, prosperity, security, they're all challenged right now in one way or another. I also believe, as I said earlier, that the EU develops through crisis. And I also believe that the answer is more integration, not less integration. I don't believe that this is going to happen overnight. And to be quite honest, I'm frequently frustrated by people using the EU as a scapegoat. A lot of national politicians do this. Everything that's bad is from the EU. Everything that's good is thanks to me. That's pretty much the approach that a lot of national politicians have around uh, Europe. And I don't think that's the right way to go about it. I think we have a lot of populist movements from both the left uh, and the right. And there is an embedded paradox in all of this. And the paradox is that the solution to the euro, the refugee crisis security, is basically more integration. And on security, a lot of people want that. On the refugees, a lot of people want that as well. But the problem and the paradox is that the deeper we integrate, the more frustrated people have a tendency to get and the more distant they feel from the European uh, Union. I don't think that the EU will snap. 
but there will be probably more animosity among the general public, and there will probably be a rise of nationalism. And I summarize my talk today on three points. Number one, I think the deepening of the EMU is necessary. Number two, I think the refugee crisis is a defining moment in the history of Europe and we need to harmonize asylum policy. Number three, we need a stronger commitment to the EU. It's easy to bash the European Union, but really at the end of the day, it's about finding common solutions to common problems. I leave you where I started. I've been told that there is a Dutch TV show which is called College Tour. Is that true? Dutch students? Yes. yes. The college tour, uh, some famous person, you know, Bill Gates or someone is interviewed by a journalist and the audience is students. And part of the uh, production and part of the format is that at the end, the person who's interviewed gives a piece of advice, a motto of sorts, for the students. And I thought hard about this, you know, what would be my motto to you apart from you know, warm heart, cold head or work hard, play hard. And I thought, well, I'll go to what I say to my kids every night when we go to bed. And it's four words, four very simple words. But I think they will work for you here in Bruges and hopefully for the rest of your life. And the four words that I say are dream, believe, work hard, and succeed. Thank you. Monsieur le ministre Stoop, Monsieur le ministre Inigo Mendes de Vigo, Vos Excellences, Monsieur le Bourgmestre, Monsieur le Recteur, Mesdames et Messieurs, chers collègues, Avant de commencer, permettez-nous de prendre la parole. Nous voudrions vous remercier chaleureusement, Monsieur le Ministre, pour votre discours euh, intéressant et pour nous avoir honoré de votre présence. Voyons qui toxia Vestana. Au nom des étudiants, Permettez-nous de prendre la parole pour formuler certaines valeurs qui tiennent à cœur à la promotion Chopin. Il est temps de parler de courage. Courage de qui Quel courage Tout d'abord, notre courage. Le courage d'ouvrir nos esprits lors de cette année académique. Le courage de la réflexion critique et de l'expression de nos pensées. Le courage de se demander, c'est quoi, en fait, l'Europe Ensuite, courage signifie oser prendre des décisions. Ça veut dire aussi mettre en œuvre ces décisions et les défendre quand c'est nécessaire. Winston Churchill, l'un des fondateurs du Collège d'Europe, a exposé son propre point de vue sur ce sujet. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Ces mots sont assez pertinents aujourd'hui. We sometimes look to our leaders to show courage. There are many current situations in which courage is needed. Courage to stand up for our values. Courage to take decisions that are not always popular. Courage to do what one feels is right. Sometimes it is hard to see what is right or what the consequences of our actions will be. <coughs> but the price of inaction is also high and dangerous. <coughs> Political courage is what is at stake these days, in unstable yet challenging times. Half a year ago, Russia sent troops to Crimea. A referendum was held on the unilateral separation from Ukraine. 
This referendum was deemed to be illegal by the international community. But this hasn't stopped Russia from following its expansion. Territorial integrity and the respect for democracy are the fundamental values of the European project we have been building since 1945. We should have the courage to stand up for these values today. Also, within the European Union, difficult and wise decisions have to be made. The Greek crisis is putting our fate in the European Union to the test. In such times, we should keep in mind that we were the ones who created the Eurozone. So, we need to have the courage to make it complete and to make it fair. We must stand up for the consequence of these decisions. What do we want our future to be like? What is the European Union that we want? In such moments, we should get back to the basis of the European thought. Therefore, we believe in solidarity, in the courage of standing up for solidarity. Ladies and gentlemen, an estimated amount of 500,000 refugees have arrived in Europe so far this year. They are here after a long journey, fleeing the war, hoping to find humanity when there is no more hope back home. They find themselves trapped in front of closed borders. For weeks, they have been camping in improvised and inhumane conditions facing the despair of uncoordinated actions by EU member states. In this situation, we want our leaders to show courage, the courage to stand up for the values of solidarity and human rights on which the Union itself was built. We want our leaders to honor our Nobel Prize for Peace, to respect the 1951 Refugee Convention, to set up a fair asylum policy. We should have the courage to welcome these people on the basis of solidarity and humanism. And we should learn from them. We can learn from their different points of view and from their different cultures. We should see this as an opportunity. More than ever, we face fear within our borders. Some current events might even send shivers down our spines. However, fear should not lead us in decision-making. Courage and vision for the future should guide us. Yet, we should not only look at our leaders to have courage. Not only the leaders have the power to make the difference, we can make the difference. The real Europe is not the European Parliament, is not the European Commission, it's not even the Council. Europe is more than 500 million individuals living from Aveiro in Portugal to Sofia in Bulgaria, from Sweden to Malta. And these people need to have the courage too in their day-to-day -day life. Courage to not give up, courage to find a job, Courage to make their own job, to open doors to the neighbors when needed. Courage to keep believing in the European project. Nothing in life is only good. There is a negative part to everything. But it's only if there's darkness from time to time that you can see the bright side. Let's have the courage to accept that we are not always right in our judgments. Let's embrace diversity. Let's make every single citizen proud of this European Union, proud of what we are. Dear colleagues, what are we? What is Europe? I would like to say that Europe is like a tree. It doesn't go straight all the time. Not all branches reach up. But still, the tree grows. 
and it takes time to grow. It is needed courage to take decisions, decisions that are not always perfect, like branches are not always straight, but still, they make the tree stronger. Even the bad decisions are part of Europe. They have, somehow, brought us to where we are today. They help to support the good ones. The world is watching us. Thank you. Bon, en sachant que, que je cours le risque d'être appelé vache espagnole à cause de mon français, hein, je le mets risqué. Hein, parce que, parce que le, le, les élèves ont dit euh, il faut du courage. Je pense qu'ici, il faut de l'audace. Je ne suis pas Danton qui demandait de l'audace, encore de l'audace, toujours de l'audace, mais il faut de l'audace. Euh, je voudrais remercier le bourgmestre de Brook. C'est un acquis, Brook Non, non, non. non. Hein? Oh, oh. Je fais Brock. 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 C'est mieux? L'année prochaine. Hein? L'année prochaine, je vais essayer. Bah, vous savez tous noter le numéro de téléphone. Il faut l'appeler seulement pour dire qu'est-ce qu'on peut améliorer. Hein? Pas pour se plaindre, parce que sinon, il ne viendra plus. Hein? Ah, das war eine hervorragende Rede. Herr Rektor, es hat uns wirklich. Äh, ich bin sicher, dass Chopin sich wirklich gefreut hat auf die Rede. Hein? Et c'est là. Et Alex, euh, euh, non, je ne veux pas parler en finnois, hein, pas encore, pas encore, hein, hein, mais euh, je me souviens de, de, du chancelier Kohl, hein, qui a été aussi présent ici, qui a inauguré aussi nos, nos cours académiques. Et, et Kohl disait un jour euh, que les vrais politiques, ce sont ceux qui ne touchent pas le doigt pour regarder d'où vient le vent. Les vrais politiques sont ceux qui disent ce qu'ils pensent, même si l'opinion publique ne suit pas. Et je crois que tu as démontré aujourd'hui que tu es un homme de conviction, un homme de croyance, mais un homme pragmatique. Et je trouve que ces trois choses, ces trois valeurs sont très importantes quand il faut créer l'Europe. J'ai beaucoup apprécié ce que, le, le, ce que vous avez dit euh, sur euh, cette image de l'arbre. L'Europe, c'était comme un arbre. Bon, c'est vrai, mais il faut des jardiniers pour soigner l'arbre. Et donc, vous êtes les jardiniers, nous sommes tous les jardiniers de l'Europe, parce que, comme Alex a dit, l'Europe, c'est une nécessité. Et donc, euh, je suis aussi tout à fait d'accord avec notre pianiste magnifique quand elle a dit que les paroles sont limitées face à la musique. Donc, je vais dire euh, seulement dans ma langue maternelle, c'est déjà une tradition... Ici, au collège, je déclaro inaugurado el curso académico 2015-2016. Gracias a todos. Yeah.